I ran a poll yesterday on YouTube. It should be noted that from a statistical point of view, polls can be fairly inaccurate. People who hold a particular point of view are often more motivated to participate than those who hold a different point of view. Plus, I don't exactly know how YouTube publish these polls. Who do they show them to? How many people who see it actually respond? Anyway, just keep all of that in mind. This poll found that only 14% of respondents were not worried about the long-term side effects of the vaccine. Now even though I never mentioned the word COVID in the question, I think we can safely assume that's what people thought, because that's pretty much the only vaccine that is being discussed in the world at the moment. 15% of respondents said they'll wait a few months before they get it, 24% said they'll wait a few years if necessary and reassess, while 47% said they will probably never get the vaccine. These poll results are in stark contrast to what the media are telling us at the moment. Even the right-leaning Sky News are telling their audience that only one in four Aussies would refuse the COVID vaccine or are skeptical. The ABC are a bit more optimistic. In an article titled, Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout has been boosted with more Pfizer jabs. We've got five quick takeaways from the PM's press conference. They stated, and I quote, Everybody who is on Australian soil will get the vaccine. They even put that part in bold. That includes free vaccines for all visa holders, refugees, asylum seekers, temporary protection visa holders, and anyone on a bridging visa. And those who have had their visas cancelled but are still in the country will get one as well. See how they use the words will get? In their eyes, Australians will get the vaccine. There's no doubt in their minds, or at least that's the message they're trying to convey. As the days go by, I found the ABC doubling down on their pro-COVID vaccine rhetoric. In one article titled, I'm a doctor and one of my best friends doesn't believe in vaccines. This is what I want to tell her. The author tries to scare us into submission. She starts off by saying, Thanks to my job as a doctor in a small regional hospital in Tyrol, in Austria, Yesterday I received the Pfizer COVID vaccine, and although you might think that I resent the residual muscle ache, just a normal post-vaccination tenderness, no other symptoms, I actually kind of love it. My fingers keep finding it and pressing it like a kid with a bruise. So not only does she encourage us all to get vaccinated, she openly loves it. If you continue reading the article, it has this rather divisive subheading, Vaccinating isn't a personal decision. Oh, isn't it? Explain, please, Doctor. One of my best friends here in Austria is a musician with four kids. She is one of the kindest souls I know. She also doesn't believe in vaccination. For the sake of social harmony, we always avoid the topic when it arises. We're both big believers in the general principle, live and let live. However, I want to say to her that when her husband has sudden onset chest pain, it's me who she brings him to in the emergency department. It's me and my medical knowledge she is putting her trust in when she asks me to find out what's wrong and treat him. So why doesn't she trust that same medical knowledge when he's healthy? Well, first of all, you might be a great emergency doctor, but that doesn't necessarily mean you know anything about virology and the new vaccines. As I've said before, the most mature of these vaccines is less than one year old. How can anybody claim to know anything about its potential long-term side effects? The only way we will know this is through a lot more testing and monitoring. She goes on, I want to tell her that I love her soul, that she is more patient and kind than I could ever be, but that her anti-vax views are contradicting that entirely, because to not vaccinate is not just a personal decision, it's a big F you to all the people in your community. Okay, now she's starting to deride people. She's saying that if you don't get the vaccine, you're being extremely selfish and telling the rest of the world to F off. It's probably not the best way to convince people to take the vaccine. Remember how I mentioned that in this article she tries to scare us into submission? Here's what she said. Sure, you might not care about getting measles or the flu or COVID, even though you should. Have I told you about the otherwise very fit and healthy 46-year-old from my ward who has been on the ICU with COVID since November and is currently awaiting a lung transplant if he doesn't die first? Selfishly, I don't want to get as sick as the man trying to outpace death waiting a set of new lungs, and because I don't want my grandparents to either by me inadvertently giving the virus to them. Ah yes, if you can't convince people with science, try to scare them instead. 
So yep, even though my arm is admittedly a little bit sore today, I will be getting my booster in three weeks. And even though I hate doctors' waiting rooms, and even though my toddler, and probably his older sisters too, will definitely scream at the jab in their arm, it's way more important to me to put Sophie's needs before my own kid's comfort. That's just the kind of person I want to be. So she wants to be a mother who forces her children to have a COVID vaccine when even the vaccine manufacturers are not even recommending their own vaccine to be given to children. Even pro-vaccination Dr. Anthony Fauci isn't recommending giving it to children until at least late spring or early summer, so June or July this year. To be fair to the doctor, perhaps that's what she meant. I'll give her the benefit of the doubt and assume that she's not forcing her children to get it right away against all medical recommendations. But this is a very common tactic in the media at the moment, to try to scare people into getting the vaccine. How COVID harmed our children, girls most of all. London COVID, Newbury Park dad, 40, dies of COVID three months after buying a house for young children. Child aged 7 dies as England coronavirus hospital deaths rise by 630. Yes, I could go on and on. There's plenty of articles out there trying to scare you into submission. But can't we find examples of nearly any virus killing people? Here's some news headlines from before the pandemic started. More than 140,000 die from measles as cases surge worldwide. And from the ABC, parents urged to vaccinate children against flu after 37 confirmed de deaths this year. Those 37 deaths all occurred in a single state, New South Wales, between the 1st of January 2019 and the 14th of May, so less than five months. Does anybody remember that? Does anybody remember being scared of the flu and racing out to buy masks and practice social distancing? From 2018, air pollution kills 600,000 children each year, according to the World Health Organization. Yes, the world is a dangerous place, even before the pandemic. Pretty much anything can kill you. If I pick a random topic, I bet I can find somebody who died from it. How about lychees? Isn't it funny how a lychee looks a little bit like a coronavirus? Searching the web for lychee deaths, it didn't take long. This is from the ABC from 2019. Encephalitis from lychees kills 31 children and hospitalizes dozens more, Indian officials say. Yes, even lychees were killing people before the pandemic. In November 2019, one child dies of pneumonia every 39 seconds, agency warns. Do you remember racing around locking down the world over pneumonia? It was killing a lot of people though. There have always been lots of killer viruses and bacteria well before COVID ever came into the picture. It's just that COVID has had much more media attention than everything else. So at the moment, the media aren't worried about us eating lychees, or catching measles, or dying from the regular flu, or even air pollution, which kills hundreds of thousands of children every year, many times more than COVID ever will. The only thing that matters to the Australian media at the moment is the Australians who don't vaccinate and how we can change their minds. Yes, it's all about trying to convince you to get the untested vaccine. They want you to feel guilty. They want to label you as selfish. They want to say that you're ignoring science. They want to scare you. But none of them seem to be able to tell us if the vaccine will actually prevent the spread of coronavirus. The BBC published an article yesterday. Can you still transmit COVID-19 after vaccination? There's no evidence that any of the current COVID-19 vaccines can completely stop people from being infected, and this has implications for our prospects of achieving herd immunity. In the article they ask, what type of immunity do the COVID-19 vaccines provide? In a nutshell, we don't know, because they're too new, says Professor Keith Neal, who is a professor of epidemiology at the University of Nottingham. So if we don't know everything about the vaccines, why the hell are we trying to convince people to take them? We're basically trying to coerce people, smart people often, into taking a drug that isn't fully tested. What a gullible bunch of people they think we must be. Luckily, lots of people are standing up against this. In The New Yorker, why are so many healthcare workers resisting the coronavirus vaccine? In The Guardian, there is a lot of distrust. Why women in their 30s are hesitant about the COVID vaccine? And in CNN, new data shows many black Americans remain hesitant to get COVID-19 vaccine. The answer to all of this is simple. People aren't stupid. 
This has got nothing to do with anti-vaxxer propaganda. This has not got anything to do with conspiracy theorists. This is just normal people using their brains and realising that the media are trying to brainwash them to take a vaccine that isn't fully tested. And it isn't fully tested. Even the scientists will agree with me on that one. These vaccines have been rushed. There has been no time set aside to determine their long-term health effects. There are still many unanswered questions. Pregnant women, the elderly, still unknowns in coronavirus vaccine rollout. Do COVID-19 vaccines prevent transmission of coronavirus? And how much does that matter? Should I still wear a mask after getting the coronavirus vaccine? Yes, for many reasons. Scientists fear COVID-19 variant is taking the edge off vaccines. All these unknowns, yet we have these doctors published on the ABC telling us that vaccinating isn't a personal decision. And if we don't get the vaccine as soon as possible, we're telling people in society to F off. These doctors are telling us that if we don't take the vaccine, we'll end up like the fit and healthy 46-year-old who's in the ICU awaiting a lung transplant if he doesn't die first. The doctors are telling us that we should trust in the science, but yet they try to manipulate us with scare tactics. This rhetoric is just as bad as the hardened anti-vaxxer rhetoric that they claim to oppose. Occasionally I run into somebody online who says something like, To all who will not vaccinate, maybe you can gather in your own little herd and extinct yourselves as you pass the infection amongst you. Seems you will all be no great loss. People like this, I think, are overplaying the dangers of COVID. In Queensland, a total of 1,311 people have tested positive to COVID at some point, with only six people ever dying from it, none of which have died since April last year. Hardly Ebola. We're obviously getting better at treating people with the virus, as expected. Even among the most elderly and frail of Australian citizens who are in nursing homes, out of 2,051 residents who caught COVID, 685 died. That means 1,366 people survived. Will COVID make the human race extinct? Certainly not. Anyway, regarding the vaccine, I say, no, thank you. I'll wait till the science is conclusive before I consider taking it. And if I have to wait a few more years, so be it. 